chapter 28 and starting at verse 10, which is entitled, Jacob's Dream at Bethel. Jacob left Bathsheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head, and he set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called the, that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I'm taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house and of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Amen. Good morning. Uh, before I bring a, a message in the series, I just want to encourage you about the news that happened overnight. Uh, I, I quite like to study end time and done it for years. It, in my early Pentecostal days, it's all about the end time stuff and the Holy Spirit and, uh, and end times and the Lord coming back aren't preached very often. So I just want to encourage you with a few verses from Scripture because all that's going on is prophesied in the Bible. Do you know that 28% of the Bible is prophetic? I said prophetic, right? <laughs> Either from the first coming of our Lord Jesus Christ or his return. And I just want to read a, a little bit of Zechariah chapter 12, it says um, uh, the Lord who has treasured out the heavens, who lays the foundation of the earth, and who forms the human spirit within a person, declares I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends all the surrounding peoples reeling. Judah will be besieged as well as Jerusalem. On that day when all the nations of the earth are gathered against her, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations. All who try to move it will injure themselves. On that day I will strike every horse in panic and ride it. And it talks about how the Lord will protect Jerusalem. It's probably a reference to Armageddon. But anyway, just to let you know that God knows what's going on. And then a bit later it says, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have peers and will mourn for me as one who mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. So in all this end time stuff, God is moving throughout that whole region in preparation for his return. I know it's tough, I know it's awful, but if you study it, there are many, many verses. Daniel, Ezekiel, you know, New Testament as well, Matthew 24, uh, a lot in Thessalonians that tells us that God's in control. In the meantime, we pray for the people, believing that God knows everything that's going on. I'll leave that with you, but there's many, many scriptures that uh, tell us that God knows what's going on. Hallelujah. Anyway, I was given this subject wherever we are, and the, thank you for reading out the text. 
And every one of us outside the church obviously has time not in the church. I mean, some of us work and we're tired, we go to school, go to college, uh, do work. And we must realise that, that Christ is with us. And this is the theme of the message, that God is always there, Christ is in us, working through all our situation where we might be. So I just want to grab you in a moment. Come here, my dear. Come here, stand up. Right. The, the, the Bible calls the Holy Spirit the paraclete, the one who walks beside. So when we're walking into work or stuff, the Lord is right there with us, helping us to walk in the right direction, at the right speed, helping us to make decisions in life. Thank you, June. So he is a constant companion. Yeah, right there. <laughs> well done. But for many of us, we get too busy and we often f f forget that God is able to speak to us. And God, God is there. I remember some 50 years ago, so I'm getting quite old now, I was at an AOG conference and I, I walked from the meeting where there were thousands of people back to my chalet where my wife was taking care of our 12 children. And... Um, <laughs> Sorry. As I walked across the grass, I, I felt somebody touch my shoulder and I turned round in the darkness, I could see nobody. And the Lord spoke to me about being a minister for him. I'll never forget that moment. That moment changed my life. So, you must understand that wherever we are, he is. Wherever he goes, we go. We're together. We cannot be separated from Christ in us. And that really is very helpful when you have tough times at work. I worked in a secular job for most of my working life, not only running a church, but also like my friend, meeting people with all sorts of crazy ideas, but certainly ideas that are not in the Bible. So Jacob uh, encounters God. In, in our text we read that Jacob was on a journey from Beersheba into Padam Arim in obedience to his father Isaac to find a wife. That's not a bad thing to do, is it, really? I don't, I don't remember my um, father telling me to go and find a, a wife anyway. And it was from the daughters of Laban, his mother's brother, to keep it in the family, because the family of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob had to be blessed and had to be unique, yes? So the family line was very, very important. Leaving home off to a strange country to find a wife. He actually obeyed by not marrying a Canaanite woman. But his brother Esau deliberately went out and married a daughter of Ishmael to displease his father. Right? Just a little note there. Ishmael, most Bible scholars believe, because uh, she was um, not of the family of God, first what we now know as a Muslim nation. So it's very interesting how decisions that we make to go against God can have consequences, you know, two and a half thousand years later. Anyway, but Jacob, pleasing God, he had a dream of a ladder reaching heaven and angels going up and down. And, and, and God spoke to him. I'm the Lord your God and your father Abraham, the God of Isaac. And again, he repeated his promise that through him, the family will be blessed. And, uh, and God keeps his promises. You know that, don't you? When he told me to be a minister, I, I thought he was joking. I was quite happy working, raising the family being the youth leader and the children's leader and all that sort of stuff. And I, I was really enjoying life. I thought, well, I don't want to be a pastor. It's hard work, that, you know, sitting in people's homes. And anyway, I got there and, and the Lord's been very faithful to me. And I thank him for that. What an encounter for Jacob. I wonder if any of us have had an encounter with God. No? Yes? He speaks, doesn't he? Offering that still, small voice. The thing is, we have to stop, be still, and know that I am God. And in that stillness, God can speak to us. But I just want to encourage you, because some people have this um, 
crazy idea that, that God only um, uses people that are good, right? Now, I've got a, a book here, uh, All Men of the Bible, right? I haven't got your one, All Women of the Bible. A plan is quite bigger. Anyway. <laughs> so, Jacob is a man who was a bit naughty, right? So, so this is a man that God met on the road, gave him a vision, and you thought this man was really good because he's in obedience to his, his parents to keep the house of David going, right? But Jacob is an interesting illustration of the presence and conflict of the two natures within a believer. Similar to Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Jacob is good and bad. He rises and falls, yet in spite of his failures, was a chosen instrument. Jacob's character then is full of interest and difficulty because of his weakness and strength. He is not, un he is not alive to be described by a single word. For example, the faith of Abraham or the purity of Joseph. Jacob seemed to have many and many sides in life. He was a man of guile, yet a man of prayer. Inconsistencies are everywhere. His life began with the prophetic revelation of God to his mother, but Jacob's early years were a singular mixture of good and bad, the bad being very bad. Jacob was a victim of his mother's partiality. Rebecca loved Jacob. This fault must be kept in mind as we judge his character. Jacob was selfish when his brother came in from the fields, faint with hunger. Jacob would not give him food without bargaining over it. Jacob was naturally deceitful and crafty. So here we have a man called Jacob, used by God in a mighty way. And there are many people in the Bible that we know that God will take the naughty people and use him. And I, I thank the Lord that he took this naughty lad from Birmingham and through grace alone, I found Christ, and it's just amazing, amazing. We, we live in, in the last times, I, I think, and we're reading Joel 2, verse 28, and afterwards I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see vision. So I don't, I don't make any age things today, but us older men should expect to see have dreams. You younger men expect to see visions. Expect it. Walk with the Lord and be in that presence that you are willing to listen to his voice. There are other encounters that, that, that we know about other encounters where God met people, Moses in the burning bush, Elijah in a whirlwind, but in a whisper voice came, Gideon on the threshing floor, Zacchaeus off a tree, a woman at the well, Peter by his boat, Mary Magdalene looked for Jesus in a tomb, but he was behind her. Two men on the Emmaus throne met Jesus, Paul on his way to Damascus. So there's no place outside an encounter with the Lord. No place where we are not sharing the gospel by our attitude, by our demeanour and by our words. This is off my notes. In today's world, it is very difficult to share the gospel about the death, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Most people, as was said earlier, don't believe that anymore. And I, for one, find it difficult to speak to my family and close friends that don't know Jesus about that. But how can you sit down with your grandson's girlfriend and your grandson in their early 20s and tell them, unless you be born again, you will no wise enter the kingdom of heaven? That's a tough call, isn't it? Very tough. And I find that even me as an extrovert nutter, I find it difficult to do that. And I, I reckon most of you would do as well. So what do I do about that? Well, I, I'm praying. I, I play squash with, with four different people. And I'm intentional now about praying, Lord, open the door 
So the conversation opens up to stuff of the Bible. And as I was thinking about this, I think, especially in today's society, with world views and happening of today and last night, I think the word hope is a good opener. You know, I'm not bothered, I am bothered, but I understand what's happening, but I have a hope in Jesus Christ that one day he'll come back. So start at the end, right, and then come back to the cross. I don't think that helps you at all. But don't you think for one minute this guy here goes around preaching everywhere? You have to have permission to share nowadays. And I find it the worst in your family. But God can give you encounters just like he did with Jacob. A couple of verses, we know this, Psalm 139. If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light becomes night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is a light to you. Many of you know that I lost my brother in November last year. He died of pancreatic cancer after an illness. He's a lovely Christian. And I had the lovely privilege of being there at the end with his two daughters and his son and obviously his wife. And when Ken passed at 11 35 in the evening, we were all around the bed watching him just fade away. And even in that dark moment, the Lord was there and spoke to us. And the peace that we had was overwhelming. Some of the tears and the, and the sadness, the joy that Ken is now in heaven, sort of overtook that. So it's, the psalmist is right, you know. If even if the darkness we do there's light. So even when you talk to people about hope, about the gospel, he is there with you. And maybe you and I can be used to bring some light into people's darkness. I don't want to go into the details, but if you understand what will happen to people who are not born again, it's pretty tough. And the gospel is a stumbling block for, for some. But for us who have found the Lord, it gives us a lift into heaven. Jeremiah 23. Am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them, declares the Lord? Do not I fill, do not I fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord. So wherever we go, he goes. Whatever we do, he is with us. The following morning, Jacob woke up from his sleep, having had his head on a rock. I don't know how he did that, but... And he said, surely this is God's place. Surely this is holy. Surely this is a, an amazing place, and he, he, he called it Bethel. For me, this reminds me of Sometimes you'll have a conversation with somebody and it might only be for a few moments and then you come back home and you think, wow, that was amazing. How did that happen? So in the moment, you're so engrossed talking to the person and uh, God's opened the door for you to, to, to walk in and preach the gospel or be a witness and you do it and you talk to somebody and you come home, wow. Surely the Lord was with me on that moment. I remember my son, I think I told him before, he, he's not a Christian now, he's just come back from three months diving in the Philippines with his young lady girlfriend and 
a few months ago, we had a chat in the garage, and we were doing some stuff. And then, I, it was only a few moments, and I walked back in the house, and a few hours later, I thought, oh, thank you, Lord. I, I realised then that a seed was once again put into his life. And we know how the sower works, the sower sows, and most of it goes nowhere. The seed falls on stony ground, or the birds will eat it. But some will produce a hundredfold. 60 fold. So keep sowing seed. Keep remembering that the Lord is with you. He's there at the side of you, whispering. He's there to encourage you in the dark moments. He's there in every meeting that you have. So be intentional. If you're meeting somebody for coffee or whatever, just say, Lord, just give me the opportunity to share your word. And I think you said it, Christians years ago used to be judgmental and Bible bashers. Yeah? And I, I think many Christians decades ago were like this, but we, you can't do that today. All this identity stuff and everything's okay, I can, whatever I believe is right is right, and you can't tell me otherwise. Just love them where they are. Give them promise of the hope of eternal life. It's very important to understand that that the Lord knows your dilemma. You know, and it, it, it says, you know, by the foolishness of preaching, people come to know me. You know, and... Oops. <laughs> and, um... I, suppose, I hope you can see this. I, I'm, I'm sort of... Right. It's quite a simple thing, this, right? In the Garden of Eden, man walked with God, yes? Yeah, that was heaven on earth. The fall came, and that separation took place. So now we live in an earth, e -A -R, which is mostly without God. In, this, in today's society, England, 6% Christian, 94 people out of 100 are going to go to heaven, right? But those of us who love Jesus, oh, I should be read that, should I? Oh, never mind. I can't think, right? We love Jesus. Christ is in us, the hope of glory. Ephesians, we're already partakers of heavenly life, yes? When you became a Christian, born again, that moment started, you're on a different journey. You have died to sin, alive to Christ. Right. So, I don't know where my red one's gone. Anyway, let's try another colour. I've lost that one. So, the moment we are with other people and we are witnessing, this place here, where we meet, becomes a place where... Oh, sorry, can you see that? It becomes a place which Jacob talks about. Surely this place... was the house of God, Bethel. So when we bring the gospel into people's lives, we are bringing the gospel into a fallen world where we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, Ephesians, but against powers and principalities, people that hold these people away from God with all the attractions of money, sex and power and all that sort of stuff. We can bring the Jacob experience in the people's lives as we move in, in like this. Have we got that? It's a simple drawing. But I think it tries to explain what we can do. So no, no place is outside God's place. We also know that on this model is what some scholars call common grace. The Lord sends the rain and the sun on the saved and the unsaved. Yeah? So there's a common grace out there. And people misuse that. What we're talking about here is the grace of the gospel in people's lives. So Jacob met the Lord on this road. And it became a special place. And he anointed the place with oil. An Old Testament version, if you like, of the Holy Spirit. You know that each of us are anointed with oil. When you became a Christian, God got his oil of blessing, it pulled all over you. 
Yeah. Do you know that you're anointed to serve, anointed to speak, anointed to be a great father, mother, grandmother, grandfather, to be the best guy in your company? That's an anointing. See, we witness by who we are in Christ. If you walk into a room like this, hello, I'm a Christian, I was in church yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. We sang a song and, and nobody could keep up the dancing because we're all old age pensioners. Yeah. That's not good, is it? But if you walk into the room, even though you're going through all sorts of pain, and you have this beautiful anointing on you, God. God will use that, and people will say, how come you don't swear? Well, I hope you don't, anyway. How come you're like you are? Why then you can talk about Jesus? That little door opens. So very often you share with, with who you are in Christ first by what you do and the way you walk, the way you talk, or the way you don't talk, the thing you watch on TV, which actually, most of it's rubbish now, all about sex and money and buying big houses in France. Well, I don't watch that sort of stuff. Whether, whether the people who've got it flaunt it so people who haven't got it join in with that and live in their false hope. But we're, we're Christians. I want to see you in heaven one day. And if you get here before I do, just, let, just make a space for me, all right? <laughs> yeah. Why not? See, I, I don't want... Right, it's absolutely right to thank God for the cross and, and, and the suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ. Absolutely right. But you, did you know that the cross only became a symbol of the church 200 years after it was birthed? Did you know that? Because most people, you with the New Testament, lived in the resurrection life. He's coming back. He's coming back. The whole of, the whole of Revelation is coming back. So that's where I want you and I to live. Thankful for the cross, absolutely. Because without that, there's no remission of sins. Without that, there's no pathway to heaven. But yes, he's risen. And that risen life should be a part of our life and part of our witness wherever we go. It's like the old saying, you know, some people bring joy when they walk in the room, other people bring joy when they leave it. You know, Oh, to live with saints above, won't that be glory? But to live here with saints below, that's another story. <laughs> so the, whatever you are is coupled with you being in Christ. Look for opportunities when you're shopping or when you're having a meal just to talk to people and be nice. We had a meal recently, Sally and I, we could only afford a... Cheese on toast. No, no, anyway. And, uh, <laughs> and I just spoke to the waitress and chat. Well, people are chatting her up in Alta. And she thanked me. I said, you're a nice customer. We should have more people like you. She didn't mention the gospel. You see, you is who you is, and you are what you are, and where you go, wherever you go, you display, hopefully, the spirit of Christ in you, which is a resurrection life. Yes? Right, I must get back on my, on my notes. Oh yeah, there's um. Have you got a place which you might call your holy place? I mean, some people who, who are deluded, I hope this is clean, I forgot, I forgot my rubber. <laughs> One day, Many years ago, after I finished a game of squash, I realised it's better to wipe the sweat before you blow your nose. Anyway, I won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it wasn't good. It's like my mate, and I won't go there, right. So, so this is you and me, right? And we have Christ in us. 
the moment we walk into a place and we want to talk about Jesus, you actually might walk into a place where the devil is really active, where the devil has really got his claws into his person, depression, completely, you know, they curse and swear. And isn't it funny how nobody ever says, oh Buddha, or oh Allah. And yet the minute people say the Lord's name in vain, they don't bat an eyelid. And I'm getting fed up of watching films now, where the Lord's name is almost, you know. And it's a wonder why we don't put more people in trouble, just like these people try and put us in trouble by preaching the gospel. Anyway, you must realise that wherever we go, we might have encounters like this, where you leave the Holy Spirit over you. Because we know greater is he that lives in us than he that lives in the world. So when you do have an encounter, or whatever you are, and you try and witness and talk about hope and talk about Christ in you, and it really goes, and it's a rude word then, when it goes base over apex, right, understand that the devil goes around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he might devour. So don't let that discourage you. Just put on the armour of God and let that go with the Lord, because the Lord will deal with that for you. Is that okay? Because I don't, it's very, you have to be wise. You know, read, read Solomon's word about wisdom, and it's very good stuff. So this is what I call a front line, and, and it could be a battle zone, because, you know, very much, very much of um, descriptions in the Bible, Paul used it, the armour of God. You know, we're in a battle. You know, we're talking about going into enemy territory and preaching the gospel and being a witness. That is not easy. But again, you learn from that. And if you get a bad one, leave it to God. You see, I mean, what time do you finish normally? Pardon? I've got an hour to go yet. I don't know. <laughs> No, 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 no. Your path is going like this to me at the back. No, it's not. God encouraged Jacob at the stone. So much so, he named the place. So God is a God of encouragement, isn't he? And when we fall, he'll pick us up. It's amazing how Jacob has been a schemer all his life, and, and you get an insight into the family life of Jacob when you read that the uh, last verse of 27, a couple of verse of 28, it says this, Then Rebecca said to Isaac, I'm disgusted with living because of these Hittite women. If Jacob takes the wife from all the women of this land, from Hittite women like me, my life will not be worth living. So Isaac called Jacob and blessed him. Then he commanded him, Do not marry a Canaanite woman. Go at once to Padam Aram, which is in our, in our town, to the house of your mother's father, Bethuel. Take a wife for yourself there from among the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. So again, Jacob obeyed God. God met him at what he called Bethel, and God gave him a great blessing. And the outcome of Jacob's life is so much so, he's now the, the father of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. So he became the lineage of the Jewish nation. By the way, which God still loves, by the way. You know, I'm not an Israelite maniac, if you know what I mean, but God loves Jerusalem. And um, if you look at uh, Ezekiel 38, you'll see that what's happening around there is exactly foretold in Ezekiel. And if you knew the modern names of these Territories mentioned in the Old Testament, you'll know exactly what's happening. North Africa, around the East. Anyway, I won't go there. But, but you see, when you obey God, God, your outcome of your life, just like Jacob, 
will have an impact on generations to come. There are people here that have sons and daughters who are now working for the law in all sorts of things. My son, our son, is a pastor in a large church, he's an elder, he leads worship with his wife, and I thank God for that. Our other daughter works in the church, my other daughter is in the worship group at our church. But you see, Jacob was given a heritage from a continuation from Abraham, Isaac to him, and then to the Jewish nation. When you sow the seed, you have no idea what you're sowing. You have no idea this person that you spoke to last year or five years ago, who may have been a person where you hit your battle zone and you think, my life, I blew that one, it's awful, you know, I shouldn't have said what I said, whatever. You know, you, you never find out that person ten years down the road could be a man of God, a woman of God, doing amazing stuff. So keep sowing the seed. Wherever you go, take Jesus with you and keep sowing the seed because you have no idea what you're sowing. And in fact, I think it's right that you don't know, otherwise you get a bit like this. You know, you know I, I, I converted um, somebody famous, you know. Oh, I was there, Billy Graham came to all because of me. No, 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 no. You let that go. And occasionally, you will hear that something you said or did decades ago. I don't remember saying that, the person did. In a memory like mine, mate, I can't remember anything. But God will not forget what you've done. So when you have a, an encounter, when you have a Jacob moment, leave it to God. And don't, and don't worry about it. Right. His brother Esau... definitely, intentionally made the wrong decision, went against his parents' view and made a Canaanite woman. So I'm going to close now and say this. The way I try and do it, and I'm not very good at this, if I'm having a meeting with somebody, there's a guy in our church at the moment who's in deep, deep trouble. So. I'll be seeing him again this week. So what I do, I just say a little prayer, Lord, may this be an intentional meeting. So you meet somebody for Costa coffee or, well actually it's not coffee and Costa, it's not strong enough for me anyway. As you're driving there, just Lord be with us and help me to say the right thing. So, so instead of becoming a casual meeting, it becomes a an intentional meeting so that you know that you're going to go here you're not in the church you're not with your Christian bodies this person that you're going to might be a very very good friend and that's sometimes harder because it's hard to witness to someone you love yeah? or you could just be an associate a work colleague or someone you've met be intentional say Lord give me a Jacob moment give me a moment when the words I speak somehow will open heaven up to this person Jacob saw the angels ascending and descending. And I pray that some of us will see that impact on somebody else's life. Because wherever we go, the Lord is with us. Amen? Amen. And the Lord is with us. One day, some time ago, you became a Christian, yes? I guess you became a Christian because somebody spoke to you about Jesus. Maybe it was several people which you have now forgotten. But the fact is, what they said and what they witnessed to you is why you're here today. I know my sister-in-law prayed for me for a long time. And I think, well, actually, Jesus found me. So have faith. Wherever you go, the Lord is with you. Be intentional. I just pray you'll have lovely coffee time with people talking about Jesus and giving these people hope in a world which is so desperate for it. 
And if, when you read the Bible, you realise it's going to get worse, not better. Illness, pestilence, wars, it's going to get worse. But we have the hope of eternal life in Christ. So let us, by his grace, share that with the people wherever we go. God bless you. Hey, thanks for watching with Church Baptist Church YouTube. If you're new to our channel, why not subscribe? That way you can know when we post new content. Make sure you leave us a comment. Let us know how we can pray for you, what spoke to you today, and where you're writing from. And also share these messages with one of your friends if you find them encouraging and inspiring in any way. Hey, listen, if you're able to, why not join us in one of our services at our physical location? All our details are on the website. I'll see you there. God bless you.